Good afternoon. After four years of work, we, the Pacifica class of 2023, are about to graduate. But before we do that, before our commencement speaker and the bagpipes usher us into the future, I have been given the privilege of speaking to you all. And you all have been given the requirement of listening to a 17-year-old. <laughs> as high school has come to an end just as rapidly as it began, there are a million ideas and things I could dive into. Questions that we tackled in Old Testament, like what is the meaning of life, or what makes something beautiful. Or maybe our yearly themes, like rooted, or running the race. Maybe I could explore the long conversations we had about faith and identity in late antique philosophy class, or the significance of the hero's journey, and how it relates to our high school journey. However, while high school has taught me much in the classroom, and it has been undoubtedly meaningful, the two words that come to my mind as I graduate are not anything I learn through academics, but rather through connection and personhood and all that wonder which high school holds. Those words are gratitude and joy. Immediately, everyone has their preconceived notions of what these two words mean. For many of us, these two words seem to be buried under the dirt and rubble of grief and suffering or the idealistic dreams of youth and innocence which are lost in compromise as we grow older. And while you may be right to believe that, or at least too stubborn to be convinced that you are wrong, graduation is the very place where idealistic dreams of youth are celebrated and grief and suffering are set aside momentarily to smile. All I ask is that you hear me out. And so, let us begin with gratitude. In bittersweet reflection upon high school, it seems natural that we find ourselves grateful for our most significant memories. Everything can be seen through rose tint as we depart from the place that has been our home for four years. And we select the moments by which, if we, th which we think of these four years most fondly. For some of us, that may be the play and musical productions or monumental sports victories. For others, it might be rap battles on the senior trip, or retreat cabin time filled with a mixture of laughter and tears. For some, it may be Sione screaming at the top of her lungs at any given moment, or Gavin drinking copious amounts of milk at any given time and in any given place. For some of us, it may be a totally isolated or random moment, planned or spontaneous, alone or with friends, and for most of us, it is a collection of all of those things and a few more. But whatever the significant moments are to each person, we cherish them, especially as we prepare to leave them behind. This cap is killing me. Okay. <laughs> but in a few months or weeks or days or hours, all of that rose tint will wear off. And we will find reasons to be angry and nervous and happy and sad all over again. However, if I have learned anything in this high school, it is that one of our greatest faults is choosing to remain ungrateful. We cannot choose to be sad or happy or nervous or angry, but we can choose how to respond to those feelings. We can live apathetically, not caring what happens to us or around us and allowing monotony to swallow our time. We can live contentiously, finding all of the problems with around us and with others, begrudging our challenges and bemoaning our setbacks. Or we can live gratefully, giving thanks for each person, for each breath, and for each day, never losing our sense of wonder in the world. Yes, as we suffer the incurable senioritis and grow tired of high school and all of Pacifica's idiosyncrasies, we often descend into apathy and contentiousness. However, apathy is draining in its inactivity and contentiousness is exhausting in its self-pity. There is a far greater value of a life lived in a posture of gratitude, experiencing, as John O'Donohue puts it, each day as a sacred gift woven around the heart of wonder. It is possible to live apathetically and wander aimlessly, to remain contentious to the circumstances of life and the brokenness of the world, but only in gratitude do we find wonder. Only when we find ourselves thankful for life and all of its subtle beauties can we truly discover any sense of awe. Awe which inspires, uplifts, and guides us to purpose. Apathy and contentiousness provide enough for a person to exist, but for a person to truly live, 
to fully and honestly be, one must be grateful for the wonders which surround them. And yes, gratitude seems impossible in the face of suffering. The concept is fine and dandy until we encounter suffering too difficult to speak and impossible to bear. Many of us have known this firsthand. It was sufficiently feasible to live gratefully when we were innocent and ignorant 14-year-olds caught in the infancy of high school, though some of us saw harshness of reality even sooner. But when we are trapped in our homes because of a pandemic, stuck with our own already troubled and confused selves, gratitude becomes a more difficult idea. I think I can speak for my whole class, and I would assume this whole room, in saying that we have encountered more grief and anguish than we ever could anticipate. But I would encourage you all not to lose that sense of gratitude, even in those moments. As the book of James says in its opening verses, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete lacking in nothing. I am not grateful for the trauma, for the hurt, because they were easy or even bearable, but because they hold moments, they hold memories, they hold quiet miracles, which I cling to. I wholeheartedly believe that suffering is far more livable when you find small and silent wonders which persevere in the darkness. This cap is still killing me. Do you want it? And then there's joy. <laughs> One of my dad's best friends from college was a youth pastor in Kansas City a few years after he graduated university. He told me that during his time there, one of the students asked him something along the lines of, how can you be genuine or relatable when you laugh so much? Implying that he was too jovial to be real. My dad's friend asked the young man a very simple question. Are you saying that sadness is somehow a more profound feeling than joy? We are too quick to associate sadness with hardship and joy with ease. That if you are suffering, misery is the only natural response as it displays character and humanity. And that, are you kidding? <laughs> Just, give it, give it all Just give it all to you, yeah. Um, <laughs> and that somehow, People who are joyful are people who have yet to feel enough pain in their lives. Adulthood is made up of death and taxes, and anyone who sees more than that is not truly mature or grown. It seems intuitive to consider suffering a total evil, but as Dostoevsky writes in The Brothers Karamazov, lamentations ease the heart only by straining and exacerbating it more and more. Such grief does not even want consolation. It is nourished by the sense of its unquenchableness. We, the class of 2023, have undergone a myriad of struggles and challenges as individuals and as a collective. We fought through a pandemic and online school, through the losses of loved ones before and during our four years here, through the natural growing pains of high school, and through so much more that our being here is a testament to today. Hurt is more than familiar. Nevertheless, there is a difference between our suffering and how we choose to respond to it. In endings, in death, love is not forsaken. It is re resurrected. For life's preciousness is most visible in life's vanishing. Whew. Now, there is one piece of this question. Is sadness somehow a more profound feeling than joy, which I take issue with? As Mr. Sims has reiterated over and over to me, joy is not a feeling. Sadness is a feeling. Happiness is a feeling. Joy is an act of the will. Joy is a choice you make when you get out of bed, whether you slept for two hours or ten, whether the person you liked likes you back or the person you love no longer does. Whether you are happy or sad or angry or excited, you choose joy. A joy from above, a God-given joy that says, even the darkness is not dark to you, and the night is as bright as the day. True joy, real joy, is rooted <laughs> in a will. 
a will that lives by the grace of God and the faith of man. A life lived in joy finds the wonders hidden in the bleakest of days, not only finding the light in the dark, but making light of the darkness under God's abundant providence and grace. And so, as we graduate high school and move through life, it is easy to lament it, to live in a posture of contentiousness, treating life as if we are the victim of it. What is far harder, and in my mind more commendable, is to respond to suffering with gratitude and joy, making the beautiful more precious, the beloved more loved, and the living more cherished. Undoubtedly, much will change. We won't see Quinn's iconic jackets in the hallway every morning or see him, Sebastian, and Tyler throwing a Frisbee in the most inappropriate of circumstances. We won't be able to listen to May and Eli argue over every single fundamental belief. We won't get to enjoy Claire, Francis, and Olivia leading on the march for feminism at our school. We won't see Aiden incite chaos at every corner. We won't get to watch Hul as Julia humbly dominates every academic subject. We won't get to make fun of our very own Lego man, Jordan Estes. And we won't be able to spend another year here with the mysterious Italian man, Giacomo. Yeah, Giacomo. <laughs> we won't hear Comer's rallying speeches on excellence that make anything seem feasible. We won't hear Mr. Freeborn's electric and expiring, inspiring 45-minute philosophical tangents. We won't hear Mr. McCulloch repeat over and over, take it, like it, love it, leave it, whatever you believe about it. We won't see Dr. Samita throw a dead expo marker into a trash can from across the classroom. We won't read any more poetry with Mrs. Savage or Miss Miller, and we won't listen to another pre-recorded philosophy lecture ever again. <laughs> High school is over in less than an hour. <laughs> Childhood is over in less than an hour. So much has changed. What hasn't changed is this. You will always have a bad day. You will always have someone who at least irritates you. You will always have an ache or a pain somewhere, an imperfection in your, con in, in your condition which you cannot right. However, if instead of agonizing over those imperfections, those incongruencies in our beings, we were able to be grateful for our blessings, for the gifts which are bestowed upon us daily, small and large. And as we find our gratitude, we find our joy, enduring hardship, celebrating triumph, and cherishing everything and everyone all the more, knowing that we may lose them. If we live with joy and gratitude, the wonders stay wonderful and the pains become duller. High school is full of insecurity, anxiety, failure, embarrassment, grief, and pain. All of that is inevitable. But to answer the question, is sadness more profound than joy? It is not. Joy is more profound. Joy should be our aspiration. It is not easy, nor is it popular. Even so, in the words of G.K. Chesterton, I would maintain that thanks are the highest form of thought, and that gratitude is happiness doubled by wonder. I am not joyful because life is full of ease. I am joyful because life is full of wonder. And that wonder is not the, an idealistic dream of some overambitious 17-year-old, but a gift of a God far greater than I. And it is beautiful and true and found wherever you are willing to search for it, calling upon our hearts which remain restless until they rest in you. I am grateful for all of you and all of this, and I am joyful and happy too. I can no other answer make but thanks and thanks, and ever thanks. Thank you.